We're going to turn tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, reading at verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come to you now to ask that you bless this meeting. We um, remind ourselves once again that you have so much more vested in the meetings than we ever could because you're the one who died upon Calvary's cross for your own sake because of the great love that you have for us. I pray that you would help us to understand these things and <clears throat> Father, that we would not be a hindrance to others in your purposes. We know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I pray that we might think upon these things every day very carefully as we deal with those round about us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked at this chapter the last time I was here. This chapter is really a prophecy concerning the last days. It describes the world filtering down into the church such that there is little distinction. I pointed out to you that this observation was made in Dr. Henry Morris's notes concerning this chapter. I would encourage you to read them. The world filtering down into the church such that there is little distinction between the church and the world. This chapter is about people who have a form of godliness as we read in verse 5, but deny the power thereof, denying the power by not allowing the Lord to convert them, to change them, to become what the Lord wants us to become, to be representatives in this world of his nature and his character. We are not like God. By nature, we are ungodly, and we need to be converted. We need to be changed to be like God those that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof are those who resist the converting efforts on the part of the Holy Spirit of the human soul. The question is, could it possibly be that uh, you could be a person like that? One of the epidemic problems of the last days is that of the false profession of faith. It's that of people believing themselves to be saved, having a form of godliness, but in reality not converted. Another thing that you uh, notice here in this chapter, and it stands out in, in, a, in a very conspicuous way, is the characteristic of those who have a form of godliness to have a critical spirit of the leadership that the Lord raises up. 
Read with me. Verse 8. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Moses was the leader that God raised up among the Lord's people. One of the characteristics of the last days <clears throat> is that there will be people <clears throat> in the Lord's work, right in the middle of it, that will not have respect for the leadership that God has raised up for them. Those to whom the Lord has given the spiritual oversight of the church. Folks, I would encourage you to think very carefully about your attitude toward church leadership. Because not having the kind of respect that you ought to have for the leaders that the Lord raises up for you is a certain characteristic of the last days and this worldly mentality that has filtered down into the very church of God. Just because you go to church, just because you have a form of godliness doesn't mean that you're saved. It doesn't. So how do we test ourselves? How, how in a practical way do we discover the truth about ourselves? And believe me, this is the great issue of life. It's the great issue of this book. Is learning that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and if we're not careful will deceive our very selves about ourselves and our relationship to the Lord. Believing ourselves to be saved when we're not saved at all. All throughout the scriptures there are numbers of passages that we could reference concerning the folly of not respecting the leadership that God raises up. One of the reasons this is so vitally important is because it's an earthly type and measure and manifestation of your respect for God. A person that cannot respect the leadership that the Lord raises up over them cannot respect God. This message tonight is in a way a requested message because so often we do not address some of the problem areas that people have in, in trying to live the Christian life and I'm being told continually that we need more messages on Christian living in this church. I personally uh, enjoy studying other kinds of things. I don't know why, uh, but I love Bible prophecy. I, I love just going through and trying to analyze and understanding the understand the the, the meaning of certain passages in the scriptures and, and um, I'm sure that it's true concerning myself that I have not brought a lot of messages that deal with just where the rubber meets the road how, how to live how to, how to get along with people which seems to be the real trouble spot getting along with other people I'm going to call this message tonight, How Do You Deal With Porcupine People? Porcupine People. How do you deal with porcupine people? Now, can you figure out what I mean by that? Have you ever tried to love a porcupine? Have you ever tried to get close to one? Well, you know, if you get close to one and try to hug one, you're probably going to get hurt. You know, there are people that are like that. There are people in this world, if you try to get close to them, you're going to get hurt because they'll hurt you. The reason is because of the way we are by nature. By nature, we're, we're self-centered. 
uh, we think primarily in terms of ourselves and uh, it's so easy for other people to offend <coughs> uh, to say something that just doesn't strike us quite right and all of a sudden our defense mechanisms go out like the porcupine quills and if somebody tries to get too close within our comfort zone uh, then we prepare for war we prepare to protect the self that's what we do and so all these porcupine quills that stick out we might call defense mechanisms and a lot of times when you get around people who are preoccupied with the self this is exactly what will happen uh, rather than being a minister rather than being one that has been really converted to understand their reason for existence in this world they live the unconverted mentality which is that the universe and everybody that is in it exists for me I'm the center of everything and what is good and what is bad is going to be determined by how it ultimately affects me I exist for my own pleasure and if the people around me do not serve that pleasure then they're my enemy and I'm going to re respond to them accordingly and so you have this problem of dealing with people that are like that, people that will hurt you. Uh, and there are people that will hurt you. And, and so what is the responsibility of the Christian in dealing with people like that? Are you supposed to try to get close to them anyway? I mean, from the last message that I preached, it, it certainly, I think, gave some the impression that regardless of, of how uh, uh, hurtful people are the problem is really in you and if you just deal with the problems that are in you and respond to them and react to them correctly then that's the end of your responsibility but that doesn't make the fact that some people are just this way and a lot of times uh, you're, you're placed in settings where you can't really get away from cer certain types of people like that because you work maybe in the same uh, location and you deal with them every day, day in and day out, and you can't really just get away from them. So how do you deal with them? How do you live with them? Well, I want you to understand that the Bible uh, does address that. And if you want to know how to get along with people who have some serious problems and that make your life difficult, make you feel uneasy every day and sometimes miserable every day because of the things that they maybe say about you or the way they treat you or whatever, then I would encourage you to read the scriptures in this area. Study it out. The Apostle John, in 3 John, uh, chapter, well, there's only one chapter, uh, wrote about Diotrephes. Now, we're not going to turn to these because there isn't the time, and I want to try to rush through some of these points, and you can study it later on your own. But he said there, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. All right, now here's a problem guy in the church. Here's the, you know, the beloved Apostle John, the Apostle of love. And, and here is this man that did not treat them kindly. He didn't receive them. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, this is a church setting. This is a person who no doubt believed that uh, he was 
a child of God? I mean, why else would you go to church? I mean, he wasn't a brute atheist. He was a, a person who was involved in the church and, and was there every day among the Lord's people. But he was a problem. A very proud man. A man who loved to have the preeminence. Now, I just point this out to you to let you know that the Bible does address the fact that there are people like that. And so what is your responsibility toward them? Well, you need to read that passage and see if you can find anything that will help you understand how to respond. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul wrote about Alexander the coppersmith and how he did him much evil. And then he said the Lord reward him according to his works. <coughs> so here's the Apostle Paul. <coughs> I mean, think about this. One of the greatest Christians that has ever lived. A tremendously wise man. And he had this fellow that did Paul personally much evil. So what did Paul do? Did he just go up to him and hug him anyway? Paul warned, he said, Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. You need to read the passage. How did the Apostle Paul deal with this man? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul said, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith, and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Well, that gives us a little hint as to how the Apostle Paul was dealing with troublesome people. Everywhere that the Apostle Paul went, he ran into people like that. Some people are very difficult to deal with. Some people are virtually impossible to be close to. They'll hurt you. And you can try as you may to win them, to try to get close to them, but it'll be to no avail. And so what do you do? You need to read these passages and think very carefully about the counsel of God in dealing with such matters. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul wrote, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now here we get a little bit of insight as to how you're to handle a situation like that. Here Paul says, withdraw yourselves from those that walk disorderly. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but are busybodies. So Paul here talks about busybodies. You know what a busybody is? You need to think about what a busybody is. Make sure you're not one of them. Paul says, Now them... That are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. 
But ye, brethren, be not weary, weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. How do you deal with people that are disorderly? Well, the Apostle Paul said to have no company with them. But then he says, yet count him not as an enemy. Yet count him not as an enemy. He's not your enemy. He's your ministry. There's a difference. Folks, you see, our problem is our perception of other people. How do we see them? Do we see them through the eyes of an unregenerate person, or do we view them through the very life of Christ, through the very eyes of God, who died for them? How do we view them? Are, are, we, are we busy in the ministry of trying to assess their condition so that we can minister to them and treat them? I mean, that's what our purpose is in the world. It's not to go around and find fault in people and go around and destroy them with what we discover by talking about them, gossiping about them. That's not the life of a Christian, folks. That's having a form of godliness but denying the power of God to work in you to minister to people that have a problem. Don't go around thinking, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. When you, when you have a critical spirit of the people around you and a critical spirit of the church and a critical spirit of the leadership in the church and the Lord's people in general, that is ungodliness. And if you're not careful, you can come to a church like Calvary Memorial Church and actually come to a place like this for many years and be just as lost as you can be. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, the power that the Lord is trying to work in you to change you to become a minister. I think it's worth mentioning this. Sometimes godly men will be wrong and stand in need of correcting. You find an example of that in Paul correcting Peter publicly see that in Galatians chapter 2. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And so here is the Apostle Paul correcting Peter publicly in front of everybody. Now, it's very important to understand that in this same chapter, Paul said in the sixth chapter, or this same book, Galatians, he said in the sixth chapter, Brethren, if a man be overtaken on a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here's an example of two godly men where one of those godly men corrects the other godly man in a public setting. Well, one thing to consider is did he do it for reasons of self? Now, if you read the passage carefully, you will discover no. No. It was for the gospel's sake. It was for the Lord's sake. Did he love Peter? Yes, he did. Did he esteem him highly? Yes, he did. He loved him. He loved the apostle Peter. 
But your love for a person, I don't care who he is, can never be greater than your love for the truth. The truth. For the testimony of Jesus Christ, for a, a perfect understanding of, of the meaning of the gospel and what he did and what he purchased for us. It was tremendously important that Paul intervene in the situation as he did and correct it because Peter had influenced publicly many people down the road of error. And it was critical. You see, he understood that it's not who is right. He understood that it's what's right. You better watch your loyalties. Your loyalties can be sometimes greater toward an individual or an institution than it is for the Lord and for what's right. And we learn from this passage that the most important thing is the truth. That's what's important. It's the truth. And you see, that's not some personal thing where our defense mechanisms are coming out for reasons of self. We are not the truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. And we've got to learn to discern the difference. Sometimes godly men disagree so bitterly they, cannot, they can't work together. Is that possible? Is it possible for godly men, I mean truly godly men, to have such a conflict among themselves, such disagreement, that they can't even work together? And the answer is yes, it can be that way. And there's an example of it in Acts chapter 15. We looked at this uh, many, many months ago, uh, maybe uh, a year or two ago. I remember when we were studying some in uh, the book of Acts. But it had to do with a conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Listen to the words. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of God and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul took Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren of the grace of God. Now you can study this passage carefully, and you can try to see who was in the right and who was in the wrong there. But the point is, and the question is, can godly men disagree so bitterly they cannot work together? And the answer is, that's, absolutely, they can. And um, the important thing to notice here is that neither Barnabas nor Paul were so consumed with self-interest and their own ego and their own point of view and position that they spent the rest of their lives going around among the brethren trying to recruit, recruit um, opinions against the other. They didn't do that. You know where their focus was? The ministry. It was still the ministry. It was still the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, folks. Barnabas was a godly man, full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost. Read the book of Acts about Barnabas. John Mark was nephew to Barnabas. And it was probably... John Mark's mother that provided, and father, who provided the upper room where the Lord Jesus and the disciples met for the, the Last Supper. He was from a wealthy family. John Mark would later 
maybe as a result of the encouragement of Barnabas, would later get turned around. He would later get straightened out. He would be the one who would write Mark's gospel after this. Mark's gospel. So how do you understand it? Well, it's a little bit complicated on the surface. But what you look at is the outcome. (coughs) Barnabas was a noble man. He was a godly man. The apostle Paul was a godly man. He loved God. He loved the Lord. And, and when you study the lives of these men, the, the, the way they, they crossed the finish line was good. The Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. He was a defender of the faith. And everything that you read about Barnabas is good. What are people reading about you in your conflicts? What are they reading about you? People are reading you. People are forming opinions about you every day, depending on how you react to people. And and the actual relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Folks, let me tell you something. So many people are destroyed because they're consumed in conflict with people around them, so much so that the Lord is completely left out of their life. And that's the truth. We need to be those who every day are consumed with Jesus Christ. With Jesus Christ. If if after all of the mention that has been made in this church about the need to meet with the Lord and meet with Him every day and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, shame on you. What do you think Christianity is all about? It's not some collective, you know, thing. It's a, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the question is, do you have one that is real, that is meaningful, that is deep, that is precious? I mean, what is there about your life that you, that you can look into privately and personal beyond the, the reach and knowing capacity of any other human being? That would prove to your own mind and conscience, your own heart and soul, that you're sold out to Jesus Christ. That you understand the gospel as it relates to you. That you see yourself as a a hell-deserving sinner that doesn't deserve the, the, the kindness of the people that are around you. Why in the world do we exist on this planet? We do not exist to, to go around and, 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 uh, and, and have this, this you know, inflated view uh, uh, by the people around us toward ourselves as though we're some kind of wonderful human being. No, let me tell you something. The message of this book is from God himself. We're monsters of iniquity, to quote Parrish Reedhead. If you haven't listened to that tape, Ten Shekels and Shekels in a Shirt lately, you ought to get it out and listen to it. You ought to listen to it once a month, the rest of your life. We're monsters of iniquity. That's what we are. And, And the humanism of the world has so filtered into the church and into our own lives and our own minds, we're not able many times to distinguish the fact that we're worldly and we're behaving just like the world does in our relationships with one another. And we have this form of godliness, but we're denying the power of God to to change us. so that we can have a proper response to the people around us. If you ever hear anybody in this church that's critical of the leadership in this church, then you mark that person and you understand and you remember this message. That person is in danger. That person has a problem and they need to be ministered to by people of understanding because they're in a desperate case 
and they don't know it, and they need help. It would be a tragedy for somebody to come to this church and harbor such feelings and, and go around and behind closed doors and in dark places and, and with favorite friends and so forth and speak critically of the leadership that God has raised up. And I say that because it's happened. It's happened. And it's really been going on for years in this church. For years. Pastor Kelly suffered uh, continual abuse by factions in the church that would rise up with a critical spirit. That's a dangerous thing to do, folks. Read the Word of God on this subject. Read the Word of God on this subject. There are two critical observations I would like to make that we need to think about very carefully. I know I'm not going to get to finish this message, but it'll sure, certainly get us sort of in a track here to maybe address these things again. But there are two critical observations I'd like for you to take home with you and think about carefully. By nature, every person believes that he or she is capable of divining the motives intentions and perspective of the people around us. Every man by nature is that way. Have you ever sensed it in yourself? Here's this person over here and they're doing something that you see and it, it kind of strikes you the wrong way and so your mind goes to work. And a thought comes to your mind, I know why they're doing that. I know. We think that we're capable of divining such things. We think that we're, we're capable of divining people's intentions in terms of what they do. And so... We set about to explain to the people around us all about these really bad people, these really messed up people. Oh, we understand them so perfectly. You know, the Lord Jesus said to not judge according to appearance, but righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. What is righteous judgment? Well, I'll tell you what righteous judgment is. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Because the Bible says concerning you, there is none righteous. No, not one. So, in the judgment department, what do we have to do with judgment? Nothing. What do we know? What do we know about other people? <clears throat> the second most complex thing in the universe is a created human being, created in the image of God. Do you think you know other people? Do you think you know God? Do you think you can divine the unseen world of the, the mind and soul and spirit, the heart of another human being? I don't think so. I'll tell you something, folks. If I know that a lot of times I, I fail in this area. But I've gradually learned over the years by tragic mistakes in judgment that I don't know as much about people as I think I know at all. And sometimes I have been so certain about certain people's motives and intentions and the reasons as to why they did whatever to find out sometime later that I was completely wrong. Completely wrong. Completely. 
And I'm telling you that my judgments were on the level of execution. I mean, I had judged these people as, uh, as completely unworthy, worthless human beings for what they were doing. Oh, how little I understood. How little we understand. How little we know about righteous judgment. Do you remember the Apostle Paul when he was out there hauling into prison men and women and children? Many of them being put to death. Stephen being stoned right there in front of him. His garments being laid there at his feet. And we look at this monster of iniquity. The, the Apostle Paul. And we wonder why in the world would God not kill a man like that. And cast him into hell. A worthless, worthless human being. Less than human. But righteous judgment didn't see Paul that way. Righteous judgment met him on the road to Damascus and loved him. Loved him. It is very difficult for us to look behind the scenes and see what was going on, but I can tell you this. I know this is true because of other passages. The Apostle Paul, when he was living that lifestyle, was one miserable human being. He was so miserable. Outwardly, he appeared to be this monster of iniquity, this man of strength, this man that was serving God. He had this form of godliness. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a man that that knew the scriptures up one side and down the other. He was schooled at the feet of Gamal, a doctor of the law. He had all the trappings of a real Jew, a man of God. And here he was out here with his zeal, serving God and making God happy. Oh, no, he wasn't. truth is he didn't know God at all and on that road he admitted the truth who art thou Lord who art thou you don't think that it's possible to be living right in the middle of the people of God thinking with all your mind and soul that you're serving God and making Him happy. When the truth is, you're denying the power of God and the efforts of the Holy Spirit to convince you of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. The Apostle Paul is a classic example of the false profession of faith. A man who believed himself to be saved and was just as lost as he could be. But righteous judgment is looking on people like that with the heart of God. And, and here's what the Lord did. He died for him on Calvary's cross. He loved him. And he made him on the road. And he said to him, why do you kick against the pricks? Why do you resist the, the Holy Spirit that is, is making you miserable because he's convincing you of sin? And it's the sin in your life that's making you miserable. And he's convincing you of righteousness and you don't have it. And he's convincing you of judgment to come. And when you think about it, the truth is, you tremble. 
And when, when people talk about standing before God, the truth is it doesn't bring comfort to you. The truth is you tremble. And uh, and Paul finally heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he said, "Who art thou, Lord? I don't know you. I'm lost." And the Lord saved him. And the Apostle Paul is right now, this very moment in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and has had over 2,000 years of fellowship with Stephen with Stephen can you imagine folks you better be careful about your perception of other people or you are liable to Prove to those who hear your conversation that you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power of God to save your soul. 2 critical observations. By nature, every person believes he is capable of divining the motives and intentions and perspectives of other people. No, we're not. We don't even know ourselves, let alone others. Be careful about your judgments of other people, and regardless of what you see, so it is that you discover fault in other people's. What are you supposed to do now that you've discovered the fault? What does a doctor do when he discovers a fault? He ministers. He ministers. He works healing. That's what the truly converted person is supposed to do. The other thing that I want you to remember, and we'll end with this, we think that we are at war with other people. When in reality we are at war with our own nature. Are you here tonight miserable because of conflict with other people? And I do not minimize the fact that it's a problem. Many times, just like Paul noted with Alexander the coppersmith, as John noted concerning diatrophies, and there are others. I don't doubt that there are problems in dealing with other people. But I will remind you of something. The greater problem is not really them. The greater problem is your own nature. That's what you're really at war with. That's what our struggle is really over. It's ourselves. It's ourselves. The Lord wants us to have peace. He doesn't want us to be at war. I see people all the time. I hear the conversation all the time. Conflict after conflict after conflict. There's some miserable people in this world. There's some miserable people in this church who go home at night in an agony because of conflict with the people around them, whoever. Folks, we shouldn't live like that. I don't want to live like that. I refuse to live like that. I really do. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a tired person. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of, tired of fighting um, in a way that just doesn't win, that just doesn't profit. I'm, I'm tired of being miserable for reasons that are so wasteful. 
I'm just tired of it. I don't want to live that way. And you know something? I don't have to, and you don't either. You don't have to live that way. Did you know that it's within the scope of possibility for you to get up in the morning and decide that you're going to have a right attitude? and that you're not going to be miserable and that you're going to remember these things that I've talked about here that are so critical to remember you think it's possible that you could remember in the morning to get up early enough to get alone with the Lord and begin maybe for the first time in your life to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Your religion is not measured by your faithfulness in church attendance. There's a lot of people who come to church faithfully and come to every service and are just as lost as they can be. That's not how you measure it, folks. You want me to tell you how you measure it? It's by a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how you measure it. He measures it. He knows what your spiritual condition is. Do you have an interest in meeting with Him? Is He the passion of your life? I said this the other week. How do you examine yourself and, and find the proofs and the evidence that comfort the soul that you really have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you do not have that kind of relationship with the Lord, the, the head leaning on the bosom of the Lord Jesus kind of relationship with the Lord, Folks, let me tell you something. That's not in the Bible by accident. That scene is in the Bible for a tremendously important reason. He died for you personally. Don't think in terms of the world. Think in terms of him and you. He died for you. What is there about your life that would prove some of these indictments to not apply against you as being a person who thinks that you're saved because of this form of godliness? But in reality, there's a spirit in you that is at work against the power of God to change you. To change you. To completely change you. From a self-centered human being to being a person who lives for the glory of God. Our time is gone. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time we've had to look into the scriptures. And I pray that you would help our memories so that when we go out from this place and, and engage in the business of life, that we would not forget them, these things. That we would not forget these things. Our nature is to forget. I think largely because remembering is painful. It interferes. It gets in the way. And I'm afraid that the case so often is we don't want to be bothered. We don't want to be bothered by that kind of closeness with you. 
we'd rather just be left alone to go about life as we have been. I pray that that would not be the case, that we would be different, that we would be changed. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.